So I'd like to welcome everybody today to week eight of our GitOps on AWS webinar series. This was an eight week series that covers various topics for operating and managing Kubernetes in an AWS environment. And today's topics, we will focus on cluster management using operators. If you could flip one slide over, Mahmoud, please. We have a couple of housekeeping items, please. Um, this call will be recorded. Everybody is in listen-only mode. And if you would like to ask questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A panel. And then we will address those at the end of the presentation. Also, at the end of the presentation, we will share out a complimentary hands-on workshop registration link for this Thursday. And the workshop is sponsored by our partners at AWS. You will receive an AWS environment. And we will put um, today's learning into practice. <clears throat> and with that, <clears throat> excuse me, I would like to hand it over to our presenter today. It's Mahmoud Sada. He's customer reliability engineer here at Refrux. Here's a quick bio on him, as well as his Twitter handle and GitHub repo. And then without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you, Mahmoud. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes, fine, thank you. Awesome, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so yeah, so today I wanted to go over uh, uh, a couple of topics. So uh, first we'll talk about GitOps, what it is and why uh, people are talking about it. Also, uh, we'll go over the operator pattern, how to do cluster management with those two approaches. And then we'll go and do a demo. Hopefully, if everything's on our side, everything will work out well. As you can see on my background, we're going to do stuff in the cloud. So that's why I chose this webinar. But yeah, let's, uh, before we get started and and do these cool things, we need to go over some, th some uh, background or some history. So Weaveworks uh, kind of started in 2014 uh, during the Kubernetes early days. Uh, Alexis, our CEO, was the chair uh, in technical oversight committee uh, for Kubernetes. And uh, we also uh, have, have uh, are in the top 10 contributors to the CNCF. Uh, we lead a lot of efforts related to GitOps, in fact, the term GitOps itself was kind of coined at Weaveworks. Uh, and uh, some of the projects we work on are, include Flux, Flagger, and EKS CTL. Uh, and we'll go over what these do uh, in a little bit. Uh, we have a bunch of blog posts and talks about GitOps that you can find online on our, uh, we'll have a li share link at the end as well. Uh, we offer uh, different consulting services as well as training for teams that are trying to run Kubernetes. Um, and um, yeah, and on the software side, we have uh, Weave Cloud for smaller to mid-sized customers, as well as uh, the bigger WKP platform that that is more focused on enterprise uh, customers trying to run uh, GitOps at scale, right? Uh, so this includes managing, uh, you know, hundreds of clusters with GitOps, um, and it also gives you repeatability, flexibility. Uh, as well as uh, situational awareness, including observability, monitoring, and logging, things like that. Uh, cool. So, yeah, so we love GitOps. Uh, and basically, historically, people have been using uh, tools like configuration management to manage infrastructure, to manage applications at scale. Uh, they had a lot of advantages, but uh, they were uh, configuration management is a very uh, imperative approach to managing infrastructure. And GitOps is kind of that uh, new concept, uh, at least it's becoming more mainstream, uh, new in that sense that uh, people want to use it uh, because it's a more declarative approach to managing uh, systems. So the entire system is described declaratively. Uh, we have what's called a desired state, and we'll talk about that a lot in this uh, webinar, uh, that basically the desired state becomes a versioned concept in Git itself. And then um, approved changes uh, to the desired state are automatically applied to the system. Uh, and we'll talk about how that's implemented. Uh, and essentially, there are software agents that run in your clusters or outside your clusters to ensure that the correctness is there in your systems, as well as to notify you if any uh, drift or divergence occur uh, between your desired state and your current state. And this is another way to look at it. Uh, on the left, we have what I guess we would call the continuous integration or the developer experience, where they submit code changes to Git, they 
go over some tests, like uh, maybe there's a s system that does the testing, building, and publishing. And then um, we make another change to get to uh, propagate that change to our deployments. So whether it's deploying clusters, the infrastructure itself, or the applications, uh, as well as the monitoring, logging, and the operations themselves. Uh, and we'll talk about how those things can be implemented as well. But uh, the idea here is that Git becomes the immutability firewall, uh, unifying the deployments, monitoring, and management. Um, and the way that happens is uh, Git being the source of truth of everything in your system, um, everything from the operations uh, themselves. Uh, and those operations are, uh, can be committed via pull requests. They can be audited that way as well, uh, right, through a Git history. And all the diffs uh, of the observed state or any drift between the desired state and the current state are basically converged automatically through the agents we talked about. Um, yeah, so without further ado, uh, we'll talk about what people call the operator pattern. So the operator pattern essentially is uh, having what's called a controller. Uh, this, you can think of this as a piece of software that either your team or the open source, uh, you can get from the open source as well, that runs in your cluster or some, it runs somewhere and it watches the current state of the system and reconciles it with the desired state of the system. Uh, in order to apply this declarative approach, uh, this is kind of the community uh, pattern that uh, showed up through Kubernetes and other systems. It's essentially the building block behind Kubernetes and uh, it allows us to codify operations and uh, automate all the previously imperative uh, tasks that we used to do. So, um, and we can have those controllers everywhere, right? Uh, it's all about syncing current state with desired state, right? Uh, and we'll go over what that means. So this is what we were just looking at. Uh, let's apply it, say, on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, what it does is it watches the etcd state or whatever you submit, say, a deployment or a secret. And those that deployment or that secret gets stored in etcd, which is the database that Kubernetes uses. And then when it detects that change, it reconciles it back to etcd. So, for example, if you said I want a deployment of three replicas, uh, Kub the Kubernetes controllers themselves translate those replicas into three pods, or, or that deployment, sorry, the one deployment translates into three pods and that gets um, reconciled or submitted back into etcd. Uh, and then same thing, when those pods get created, Kubernetes watches for those changes and it goes to Docker and translates that state back into Docker uh, to make sure, say, those containers are actually spun up, right, in the right nodes, et cetera. And then uh, similarly, GitOps kind of takes this, this same exact pattern uh, and then we apply it to a more high level concept, which is everything in your infrastructure that's uh, described in Git declaratively. So maybe it's a bunch of Kubernetes clusters, maybe it's some EC2 instances, some EKS clusters, and then all of those get reconciled with the state in etcd or whatever your target uh, environment is. Cool. So, yeah, basically, you can kind of get the theme here. It's all about making the current state kind of get closer to desire, desired state. Um, and we can do this uh, by applying it in operations, deployments, and infrastructure. So we want to reconcile between Git and etcd, between etcd and etcd. And then more interestingly, uh, the community has been uh, focusing on making GitOps support infrastructure. And you probably heard about uh, the recent AWS um, uh, controller for Kubernetes. Uh, it's essentially one approach using GitOps uh, to uh, basically make this possible, having a controller that can reconcile between the etcd state and your AWS uh, instance state, right, for example. Um, yeah, so let's look at uh, how this can be applied. So. Um, so imagine we have a bunch of Kubernetes clusters. We have, a, for example, let's say there's three Kubernetes clusters. They all point to their own individual etcd uh, clusters. 
and then we have our Git repo and we want to kind of reconcile between those two. Uh, so one solution uh, that WeaveWorks we came up with was Flux and it was one of the leading projects implementing GitOps uh, for Kubernetes deployments. So what Flux does is it basically watches over your Git repo. Every time it sees, um, based on your configuration, every, every minute it checks for, um, say, any new deployments or any changes to your deployments or even deployments that were removed. And it kind of reconciles that change with uh, your Kubernetes cluster. So, so let's say you add an Nginx deployment, it's gonna detect that change in Git uh, and then uh, apply that to the cluster. And similarly, if you're using Helm, uh, the Helm operator, another solution by Weaveworks, does the same thing, but instead it uses custom resources to describe uh, a Helm release. So you submit a Helm release, the operator detects that change and it applies it back to the cluster. Um, and maybe you have your own custom uh, use case for your enterprise. You have some uh, rules that you wanna apply to make your teams more uh, uh, performant or make their lives easier. You can, in that case, uh, run your own custom operator on top of Kubernetes with your own custom logic. And we'll go over how you could do that one or one way you could do that. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, your infrastructure itself. Uh, at we, uh, you probably heard of the cluster API. Cluster API is basically a way to describe, uh, um, declaratively describe your Kubernetes clusters uh, using Git, GitOps. And um, at, at Weaveworks, we have a product called WKP, which is the enterprise uh, version of uh, or enterprise flavor of the cluster API. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but basically uh, we're through the cluster API, we're able to submit custom resources that describe your clusters, your machines, as well as where you're running them, which cloud. So for example, you might have some Kubernetes clusters on AWS, others on Azure and or on Google cloud, right? And you can describe all of those using those custom resources. And each of those clusters individually can have their own operator patterns. So you can have Flux on the AWS cluster, Helm operator on the Azure cluster, and your custom operators on Google Cloud, for example, or, or put them all on all three environments, right? So you're able to kind of scale your operations that way by uh, having a uni unified, um, unified operations across those different uh, regions or across those different providers. Um, and I want to highlight here the pink, uh, I just added, I'm gonna go back and forth here, but I just added this pink uh, database icon on top of everything that has state. So if we wanna think about it, everything here is stateless, right? It doesn't contain state except for the highlighted pink objects. So the git state, the etcd state, and the, uh, the AWS Azure Google Cloud state. So that's the only state we have. Everything else is just reconciling uh, from Git to etcd and from etcd to your infrastructure, right? So that's kind of the, the direction of the flow. Cool. So uh, like I said, Weave Kubernetes platform is uh, our uh, enterprise solution for uh, GitOps. So it's a Kubernetes application platform. Um, it has management of clusters uh, and applications. You can build uh, GitOps uh, on top of GitOps and add your, your own enterprise features as well. Um, it allows you to define clusters and components using a model-based system, which is like a bundle of Helm charts, basically. So imagine you have, uh, say, machine learning teams that want to, um, uh, want to run Kubeflow. So you can have uh, a model that describes uh, or a profile that describes uh, the machine learning cluster and any machine learning team or developer can spin up their own clusters uh, pre-configured with the right best practice so that they can run their machine learning jobs, right? So, um, and also uh, WKP allows you to deploy new clusters using uh, uh, those exact definitions uh, towards multiple backends. Um, and we have uh, alerting and operations uh, built in. So you can kind of have observability uh, right, right away from your clusters. Cool.
Uh, so let's see it in action. So what we're going to do in this demo, uh, we're going to have a, uh, an EKS cluster that I pre-provisioned uh, to save time. And uh, we're going to spin up a couple of managed uh, cluster API clusters on EC2. Uh, so this is different than EKS. We're going to spin up EC2 instances and use the native uh, cluster API provider to uh, spin up those clusters. Um, and then if we have time, we're also going to show how we can sync uh, our GitOps operations across these two EC2 clusters, as well as a kind cluster that will run locally. Uh, so uh, yeah, so let's jump into the demo. So hopefully everyone can see uh, my screen. So what I have here is um, I have my uh, a repo called GitOps Cluster Management. Uh, and in here, uh, we have a couple of manifests that we're going to describe our system in. Um, so we're going to have a examples uh, repo so, uh, or examples directory. And here we have the different things we want to try deploying to those clusters. So for example, I have uh, an Nginx pod. We're going to see how we can use GitOps to deploy this pod, uh, as well as some custom operators. So I have operators that uh, I wrote using the shell operator. <clears throat> sorry, the shell operator. Um, and I go over this in the workshop, how to actually write those operators. Uh, but for now, let's assume we already built it and uh, we just want to deploy it. So we have a, a namespace for them. So we have a, uh, this operator, what it does is it copies secrets across all namespaces. So if you put a, um, a secret in the default namespace, it will spread it across every namespace. So uh, here we create the secret copier namespace for the operator uh, and a pod to run our custom operator itself. And finally, some RBAC rules to have permission to secrets, to get secrets, list them, etc. Awesome. So what else? Uh, so yeah, a bunch of examples as well as CNI examples. So maybe uh, you want to deploy Calico to some clusters or WeaveNet to other clusters, right? Uh, so for now, this, this is just a, a set of examples. Next is we have our uh, EC2, EC2 and management directory. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, Flux running in our management cluster. And that management cluster is going to store all, uh, uh, basically our, uh, if we click here, we'll see we have a clusters directory. And this is the description of one of the AWS clusters we'll spin up. So um, yeah, and we'll go over those examples in a bit. So let me switch to my editor. So, and I'm going to spin up a, or let's go to the terminal actually. So right now, uh, you, you can, hopefully you can see my terminal. I have K as an alias to, um, uh, K as an alias to kubectl. So I'm going to run K get clusters. And right now I'm pointing to my EKS cuddle cluster. Uh, or EKS cluster that I spun up. And we can see that here um, if I go to EKS. So we'll see that I already pre-provisioned this. Uh, oh, sorry, it's in a different region. Let me quickly switch here to US East 2. There it is. So I have this Mahmoud webinar. It, that's the cluster that we're going to treat as our management cluster, essentially. Uh, and so what I have here is there's nothing running currently in the de default namespace, uh, but there is this get clusters uh, that shows up here. So what is this? This is a custom resource that the cluster API uses. Uh, and the way it was installed onto this cluster is through GitOps, meaning it was a simple Git commit that was added for this cluster to be created. So how does this work? So I have a, um, so I have a way to spin up um, Flux itself. So uh, the way this works is I have a bootstrap script that I ran. So let's go over it real quick. So what I ran here on this management cluster is uh, I do some validation here to make sure you have all the credentials set. And once that it, that's there, we create a bunch of namespaces, a set of namespaces that are specific to the uh, cluster API. So we have cluster API system, we have the kubeadm bootstrap system, the control plane system, as well as the management clusters. 
uh, and the Kappa system. The Kappa here stands for uh, Cluster API for Amazon uh, Web Services or for AWS. And basically that's where our Amazon controller is running. And that's the logs that we're kind of uh, following down here. These are logs from that controller that we're listening in on. And then after that, uh, as part of the bootstrap, we spin up Flux itself. So this is the management Flux that's gonna, it's the operator that's gonna watch our Git repo. Uh, to do this, we create the namespace, we add the Helm repo, and we apply uh, all CRDs necessary uh, for the Flux uh, for the Flux controller. And then here's the more interesting part is we point it to the to my repo, right? And then uh, we tell it only watch the management directory. So if you remember when we looked here, uh, we have this Flux management. And basically what this means is anything that's in this directory, please Flux apply it to my management cluster, right? So uh, in this case, we have one cluster called EC2 cluster one, uh, which pin, spins up uh, a cluster called Mahmoud Kapi cluster one. So what is that? This is a custom resource that uh, basically uh, describes our cluster. And here we can tell it um, how to set up the network itself. So what CIDR blocks to use. Uh, we can tell um, as well uh, which which uh, control plane configuration to use. So we tell it, please use the cube ADM control plane. And here's the name to find that uh, object, which is another custom resource. And then an AWS cluster resource, which is the kind of infrastructure we wanna spin up. Uh, and I'm, I'm using the same name just for consistency, but you could put whatever name you want here. And then here's the description of that AWS cluster. We just tell it which SSH key to use which region we want to spin it up in. And then the kubeadm control plane we just, uh, that was described above in the cluster. Uh, here we give it the kubeadm configurations we want. So, uh, and I should mention for those who don't know, kubeadm uh, is the uh, kind of the standard open source way to uh, spin up clusters um, uh, for, for fresh machines. So, you know, it's based on the Kubernetes the hard way, basically. It's, and this is kind of the, the, the easier way, if you will, to spin up uh, clusters. So, and that's the backbone of the cluster API. Cluster API is built on top of kubeadm. And this is how we pass the configuration to kubeadm itself. So things like extra arguments for the controller manager, we tell it, hey, by the way, these nodes are AWS nodes, right? Uh, same thing for the uh, kubelet arguments as well or for the join configuration. So when another node in the control plane shows up, it, this is, it should have these extra kubelet flags as well. And uh, maybe more interestingly, the replicas, the number of control plane nodes that we want is in this case three, and the version of Kubernetes we wanna spin, spin up. So it doesn't have to match the management cluster version, right? It's its own Kubernetes cluster, so it could have a separate version completely. Um, yeah. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, and if, any, if you have any questions, please post them and we'll go over questions after this demo. So, um, yeah, lastly, we have a, a couple of more things here I'll go over quickly. So we have the machine template. So this is describing the AWS machine itself for the control plane, right? And we do, then we do the same thing for the workers, which is called machine deployment. So we have a machine deployment. We tell it how many replicas, the configuration for the infrastructure, right? Uh, same thing here, we have a kubedm config template as well as a AWS machine template. And we give the workers potentially a different uh, set of configurations. Maybe the workers should have a different SSH key or a different instance type, right? And you can think of this as your node group, right? So you can have multiple of these Right? Maybe you have a node group for machine learning jobs, a node group for high CPU workloads, and another one for high memory workloads, right? So this is kind of the way you could describe these different configurations and give them different names. Uh, yeah, and it, as you can see, the whole, this whole approach is very declarative, right? We're not writing do this, then that, right? It's not an imperative approach. It's, it's, we're describing what we want the state to look like, and the cluster API takes care of 
uh, ensuring those uh, configurations are set up correctly. Cool. So, um, so we applied this already in this cluster. So we can go and take a look at what was created. So I can say get machines. So we already did get clusters and we see our cluster right here. But I can now say get machines. Oops, sorry, I did a typo here. Cool, and we see that the three control plane nodes and the three replicas, or sorry, the three workers are uh, are shown here. We can kind of even describe them, right? I can say, okay, describe machine. And I can say, I can copy this control plane one, for example. And I can see some information about the machine uh, that the cluster API catches for us. So the infrastructure reference, I know it's an AWS machine, I know the name of the machine, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, which is pretty cool uh, if you think about it, uh, that this was all done declaratively. So let's say we wanna add, uh, we wanna, something came up, we wanna change this. Uh, instead of having three workers, we wanna have five workers, say. So what I could do now is I can go to my machine deployment and I can change the replicas here to five, right? And then uh, let's say that we're in an organization that follows, you know, pull requests, uh, pull request, um, you know, access control. So what I could do here is I could say, okay, I'm gonna create a branch. I'm gonna say, scale up to five nodes or five workers. So that's the name of my branch. And I'm gonna add the flux management directory. Git commit, I'm gonna say the same thing, scale workers to five. And then finally, I'm gonna say git push or git push uh, origin with the name of the branch. So effectively here, I'm, I'm simulating what it could look like to make an infrastructure change. So I basically create a pull request. I'm saying I'm gonna scale worker to five and maybe I can choose a reviewer here and say, hey, someone with enough permissions has to approve this change essentially. Uh, oh, I think I clicked twice here, so let me go here. Okay, so imagine now the administrator of the infrastructure or the team that manages infrastructure can see this change from anyone in the organization, kind of look at the change itself and say, oh, I see what you wanna do here. Maybe write some comments. This looks great, right? And then start review and then I'm gonna say, let's say, looks good to me, right? I guess I can't really approve my own pull request, but hopefully this, this gives insight on, if, I, if someone else in the organization did it, they would be able to approve it. And then if you set up some permissions here, uh, only certain people are, will be able to merge to master. And then once we click merge, uh, what we expect to see here, let me switch here to WeWorks email and then what we expect to see here is behind the scenes uh, we have the flux uh, pod running so we can see this in uh, if you remember we we spun it up as part of the bootstrap um, so you'll see here that we have uh, well first of all a couple of things happen we see in the logs here that the kappa system detected uh, that there's new machines requested and it started spinning up these machines uh, and all this happened through just the git commit, right? So if I say, okay, get machines now, we'll see that there's two machines that are being provisioned, right? From the Kappa system itself. And we can kind of watch that and watch it happen. I can go to the UI, uh, let's switch regions here to US East one, because that's the region we chose. And I go to EC2 and we can kind of see, we, sh we expect to see here, uh, let me write mood. Yeah, we expect to see some nodes show up. And indeed, there are two initializing instances that should match. So we can see P9, B8 here. Uh, we sh it should match the one here. Oh, so this is a different ID, I guess. So we have to describe this machine here. So I'm gonna describe machine to see the AWS name. So, oh, there it is, P9, B8, C, right? Which matches this exact one. So that's kind of the flow that you can expect with uh, um, the uh, cluster API. So it's a declarative way to describe your infrastructure, describe your Kubernetes clusters through GitOps. Um, 
Okay, so let's do one other thing. So let's say we want to, so this is kind of the, how, how you could manage, uh, you know, lots of Kubernetes clusters using GitOps. So what if we want to do something different? We want to, so we mentioned there are these operators, right? Uh, so maybe I want to deploy on my management cluster a couple of other things. Maybe I want to, um, well, first we could spin up a second cluster. So let's, let's do that. So I'm going to copy cluster two from the examples and I'm going to paste them into the uh, clusters directory. So there it is. And let's go ahead and let's switch to master now. So we've already, sh I already showed you guys how to do the, uh, how, how we can approach the pull request uh, uh, system. But now let's try to do it directly on master. So I'm going to say add flex management, add a second cluster. Okay, I'm going to push. So, so now what we expect to see is Flux would detect this change and start spinning up uh, Mahmoud Capi cluster two. That's kind of what we, we hope to see. And Flux checks every minute by default. Uh, but for now, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to trigger it manually. I have this, this handy Flux CTL command that can trigger it manually for us. So we can see that the logs are, are very active. If I say, okay, get clusters, we see now that we have Capi cluster one and Capi cluster two in provisioning state, right? So this one's still being provisioned. If I say get machines, you'll see that it's going to start spinning up these uh, cluster two machines for me, um, right? So hopefully that gives you insight on how that works. Uh, so it's as simple as a git commit and a cluster shows up, right? Which is a little bit magical. Uh, so, okay, so let's see uh, how we could deploy regular Kubernetes resources. So let's copy this Nginx one. I'm going to paste it here. So that's a simple Nginx pod. Same thing. I'm going to say uh, git status, git add flex management, and add a Nginx pod. Git push. And the reconciler will take care of reconciling it eventually. We're going to let it do its thing. Let's add other other things. I want to add. I want to show you guys the operator, how, uh, the custom operators. So, I have this secret that is supposed to be copied across all namespaces. Uh, it has a very secret uh, keyword here or password called top secret, and we want that to be available to all namespaces. So let's. We could just kubectl apply, but I want to show you guys how this works in the GitOps world. So I'm going to copy this. Imagine anyone added this through a pull request, for example. I'm going to add it to the flux management directory and do the same thing again. I'm going to say add flux management. Uh, and then we're going to say add, uh, let's call it a, the global secret, right? That everyone can access. And I'm going to push. So what we expect to see, and you can kind of deduct from the logs below that cluster, stu cluster two is still being provisioned. So it's creating its NAT gateway. Uh, for example, it's VPC. All of that's happening behind the scenes through the cluster API. Uh, but right now, uh, we want to take a look at the new Nginx pod as well as the global secret. So hopefully, there we go. Git push. Let's do the manual sync. Or maybe it already finished the, the Nginx pod. Oh, there it is. So I didn't have to trigger the sync manually. The Nginx pod is uh, already provisioned. So that's awesome. I didn't have to do kubectl apply or anything. All through GitOps. And then what we want to see is the secret show up. So I expect to see, so while, while we wait for the secret to be, uh, for Flux to kind of reach this next loop, um, I want to show you guys this real quick is, so how does the cluster API store all the uh, what if I want to access, say, the cluster one, uh, cl the cluster one that we created? So you can get the cube config directly from the secrets here, uh, and I have notes on this in the README as well. So you can kind of get the cube config from here and go go access that cluster should you need to, or you know, create our back roles and things like that. But let's check again for the secret, the global secret. There it is. So Flux now has synced with Git. And we see our secret here. 
And what we expect to see is our custom operator to replicate the secret across namespaces. So if I say get secret in all namespaces and let's grab only the copy me secret and there it is. So um, behind the scenes, our custom operator detected this new secret. It listened to that event and replicated it across all our namespaces, right? All of this was through one file that we added, which is this one. Right, so just by adding a custom label that the operator listens on, it was able to detect that and replicate it across the cluster. Great, um, I don't see any other questions coming up. Um, I think there's a couple of follow-up resources that we can share out to you. Um, we do have EKS control that we went over available. Here's a public um, link for that. There's also some um, collateral that's available on our website around automating Kubernetes with GitOps for somebody who wants to have a more brochure-like material on hand. Um, there's also a couple of um, instructions on our blogs. So if you have a look at that, um, and then I also wanted to shout out to our podcast um, that's actually with our CTO, Cornelia Davis. We have some interesting episodes um, published every two weeks um, with guests from, for example, BlackRock um, that will talk about um, Kubernetes and general modern operations around infrastructure. Cool. And with that, um, I think that's a wrap. So thank you very much, Mahmoud, uh, for today, for your time. And then we hope that we see you all on Thursday. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.